Okay, good afternoon, everyone. If there's one thing we're going to do this afternoon, it's start on time. So I just want to say welcome to everybody. My name is Neil Wallace. Um, uh, I've had the honor, of, I've been asked to moderate this session this afternoon. Uh, I am, amongst other things, the artistic director and founder of the Big Sing Festival, uh, which until recently was called the International Choral Biennale in Harlem. Uh, and, uh, and, Amst and Amsterdam. I see people are now moving in. Uh, the online uh, transmission of this is not happening. There's no online, so feel free, I'd say. <laughs> um, and uh, because we're in such a small room, I don't think we're going to need the amplification, but um, uh, who knows. This session where is the future of professional choirs is clearly about one main thing. It's how are we doing in relation to thinking differently, working differently, creating differently, performing differently, differently with professional choirs. If you were to invite a group of people to dinner to discuss this issue at length, you could do a lot worse than invite these five uh, very, very experienced uh, people behind this table. I think this is an extraordinary opportunity we've got in the next hour uh, to listen to the wealth of experience and creativity, uh, skill, and so on of all the people behind this table. We have to eat a five-course dinner in one hour. And, uh, that, 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 that's correct. Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I was about to say that, um, I mean, it is, of course, totally crazy to be taking on a topic as heavy as this uh, in an hour. It's also totally crazy to be doing it at 3.30 on the 28th of July with the sun outside there. But this is, this is what we call in British conference life the graveyard slot. It's about this time, it's about this time that people have a full day and they say, future of professional choirs? No, I think we'll just go to the terrace. But anyway, compliments to you guys uh, for showing up for this debate. It just makes it all the more intimate. It gives us more chance to go into people's questions and to open the thing up, which I'm intending to do toward, towards the end. But look who we've got. Tito Fisser from the... Uh, what's your, your chief executive and artistic director? of the or, uh, Artistic director, so intendant of the, of the Netherlands Chamber Choir. We have Jenny Reinecke, who is, amongst other things, a singer, teacher leadership coach, and spends her time somewhere between the Netherlands, Germany, uh, and, and Switzerland, I think, generally. And we'll hear more about that uh, later. Magella Hollywood, who has been a director, managing director of Chamber Choir Ireland in Dublin for how long? 11 years. Gordon Cruden, amongst many other things, um, you're a consultant, you are a marketing specialist, you're a, a management a representative for artists and groups, but you're behind this table today, Gordon, because of your work with uh, Zoe Gospel Choir in, in Amsterdam. And Bernard Hess from Berlin, how many years, just for the record, with Rias Karmakor? 15. 15 years, okay. All right, so there will be no dodging of questions in this session for obvious reasons, because we do have this magnificent uh, array of uh, of, of experience. Let me just open by saying two things. The first is, there's a very cunning word in this title, and that word, it's not professional, I think we know what that is, but the word is where. This where is the future of professional choirs. We're not talking about what is the future of, personal, of professional choirs, which kind of suggests that there are questions to be answered, issues to be dealt with about Literally that, whether it's a metaphorical idea of, you know, relevance in society or the places where, you know, choirs are, professional choirs are actually working. Um, something which I'll throw out right now is uh, a very beautiful thing which Peter Sellers, the great uh, and crazy theatre and opera director from the States, I once heard Peter Sellers say, it is the duty, it is the duty of every artist to find a place of struggle and to stay there. 
very interesting. I'm going to be coming back to that. I want to find out whether this more socio-political role of professional choirs in that sense means anything to us. Um, and the other thing which I just wanted to say is, of course, let's be sure, this is not a new topic. And it is not confined to discussions about professional choral singing. It's found almost everywhere where artists are subsidized to do things. In a period of quite extraordinary change uh, on, on virtually every level uh, in the world and every level of our lives, the question of are we relevant, are we doing the right thing is becoming more and more relevant more and more relevant in itself, but it's not new. I mean, many of the debates that I have been to in the last years have concentrated on virtually nothing else. So what I'm hoping in the next hour, 55 minutes, we're going to hear something new uh, from this group about where we are on that. And that's where I'd like to start uh, throwing open the debate, Tito. I'm going to come to you first. I mean, if we're going to talk about where is the future of professional choirs, I'm really interested to know, obviously, at cruise height, where are we now? I mean, if you look back very briefly, if you look very br briefly to, you know, the, the, the Netherlands Chamber Choir that you, as it were, inherited when you went to work there, where, where are you in, in terms of this question of relevance uh, uh, right now? How far have you got? Well, let me first start by where are we now. I thought you meant the whole choir world. Ends with how will they, the professionals, maintain themselves and stay an inspiring example for many other amateur choirs? <laughs> <laughs> I find it very funny. Anyway, that's an uh, opening statement. <laughs> There's no one here from a Ministry of Culture? <laughs> no. Okay. So, but that's the program of today. Yeah? I think correct. So, um, well, I think I... There, there is some. Uh, some yeah. No, where are we today? I mean, I, uh, I think we uh, hit rock, rock bottom uh, as the Netherlands Chamber Choir nine, nine years ago, uh, looking back at the uh, uh, lack of uh, such diversity. And uh, to bring um, uh, topics um, that uh, are um, um, uh, just a significant political or social, social uh, debate or in uh, part of society. But I've seen, I've seen how the Chamber Choir has changed quite dramatically under your leadership. Can, can you tell us, just describe us to us, you know, uh, the signature of the choir right now? I mean, what's the, what's the general message which the choir is transmitting as a professional choir in the Netherlands? Well, in the, in the first instance, I wanted uh, to, I, I thought we had to tell a story. That's, that's the first thing. And then I came to the realization that I had to ask myself, as soon as you want to start telling a story, you have to ask yourself, what is my role as an, as an artist? And as soon as you look around you in the world and see what's happening, uh, then you have to ask yourself, what is my role as an artist in this world and how do I relate to that world? And that's where we have, I think, where my signature, our signature is, is to constantly create projects where where we question ourselves, um, our role but, uh, within society, but also society itself, whether it is uh, uh, an opera about a trans woman written by a trans woman, or it is uh, a, a musical travel through the mind of somebody with dementia. As long as it is authentic, as long as it is legitimate for us to do, um, it's a topic that we will but you could be running a jazz orchestra listening to you. You're running a professional choir. Yeah. What, is the, what is the essential thing which the, a professional choir can do 
uh, or is, tr is trying to do in this. We are the August of the 21st century. Yeah. We can move in space, uh, we can act, we use text. Um, uh, um, so we are in the merging of art forms. We are uh, uh, so um, uh, versatile and, and such an incredibly strong uh, uh, tool, plus the fact that there is one thing that, well, that, that we all know is which is most important is that singing uh, to me has two qualities and that's uh, vulnerability as a quality that's not even true when me and my father said or the singer said if a clarinet is singing the high note it's just a dead clarinet and what do I look at when I So that vulnerability, and the other thing is to connect people. And if there's one thing we need at the moment is to be vulnerable, admit our mistakes, also as politicians, also as, as leaders in this world. If there's one thing we need to connect, also as leaders in this world, and we have a revolution in hand. Only the problem is with the cold world, we don't realize we are. And that we are working together, that we can work together much better. Okay. Magella, could you <coughs> just answer the same question? I mean, just give us a kind of, give us a snapshot of where Chamber Choir Ireland is in its artistic journey. Can you just describe for us briefly how the um, you know the, 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 the makeup of your programs has, has changed? I mean, what does the, the pattern of your programs look like now? I suppose, I mean, we thought that you were director and people were just, just as it was all starting to go wrong financially. Um, so he took on a very brave thing, actually. He didn't know that he was getting into, I suppose, in, in that respect. Um, We, we'll obviously we'll come back to the interest of audiences uh, during during this debate. Um, I'm going to ask 
Bernard, the, the, the same question. But before I do that, Gordon, um, as a choir coming from a completely tradition, tradition, I would be surprised if you guys even worried about you know the relevance of what Zo is doing or uh, innovation in any way. Would I be right to think about to think in, along those lines? Who's? I think that if you, if you talk about roots, it's what, what I call the formal choir sector. So um, only for two years ago, I started on the invitation of the director of, uh, of the Fido. Uh, um, uh, we are part of a, uh, a, a professional choir here in the Netherlands, which is what formed during the pandemic. Prior to that, we were doing our own thing. So um, our definition of the choir is a group of people sing together. So uh, the key issue is you are not losing sleep at all about where is our future, what choices must we make. And you are managing to sing, well, the, the glorious repertoire from the, from the gospel tradition, but also um, move into, in, in, into classical uh, performances with, with Junica. Do you, do you commission work? Do you specifically invite composers to, to sit down and put notes down on paper for no, you guys? Or? No, we don't have the financial means to do that. So we have talking about the funding. So uh, we, uh, we don't have that funding at all. So uh, we have to perform the funding. Okay. So the, our mantra is that we want to do a number of performances for the benefit. Okay, so after the discussion, here is the man who runs a professional choir with no funding that line up politely behind each other to ask him how he does that. Don't try and all talk to him at once. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll come back towards the end of the session to find out what people are still having difficulty doing, uh, dreams or ambitions. So I, I will come back to you on that. Bernard, sorry, I wanted, just for the sake of symmetry, just to ask you the same question. I mean, here is a choir in Berlin with an extraordinary past uh, created after the war and uh, one of the world's top chamber choirs. But how do you, how do you deal with the question of 
uh, relevance and a, a new artistic identities? Is it even important to Rias? Yeah, I think the, the biggest break we had was uh, is, was almost 30 years ago, when we uh, we were till 1994. We were a pure radio choir. We performed for the radio, we produced for the radio, and then um, with a reunification of Germany, the the uh, Rias radio in American sector was was liquidated. And we were put together with uh, the other radio orchestras and choirs into a new holding. So we have a, um, a head uh, of administration for the four uh, uh, ensembles, but we are in, in absolutely independent in our artistic uh, development. Um, and from that point on, we had to find our, our position in the market. Um, and I'm, uh, and it really is it really is a market. You see yourselves operating in a market in a city like Berlin or Germany. Internationally as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we have to find um, our place there and we have because we have to earn our money uh, with concerts. And um, we have a, still a, a strong relationship to, to the radio because one of uh, the German national <coughs> cultural radio is one of our shareholders and um, supports the company, but um, we have to earn our money. We need um, um, fr from touring and from, our, from doing projects in, our, in, in Berlin as well. Jenny, here's a difficult question. Um, you, first of all, you, are, you work in choral leadership. I mean, you could tell, I'd like you to just tell us a little bit about what that is. Mm -hmm. And the difficult question, maybe it's more um, an, a conf an confronting kind of time of question, is um, do you, in your work, do you detect a problem in leadership in professional choirs? Um, you can name any names you like, but I mean, <laughs> I'm sure you won't. But do you, now, see, the serious question is that do you, as a, as a practicing singer uh, with a wide view of what's happening, in particularly in the European mainland, do you? Do you see the leadership thing going wrong? Um, I think that we are at a turning point regarding leadership in the choral world because, I mean, we are rooted in very old traditions regarding the music and regarding how everything is built. Um, and I think that we are in a place where we have to start readjusting a little bit. And. Um, for me personally, that includes um, also getting to the resources that the singers bring, not just their voices and their musical abilities, but also what bring, do they bring as humans, as human beings, um, and what do they bring when they really work together in a flow, let's say, flow. Um, and I think there is a lot of overwhelm because of um, big piles of responsibility on very little amount of shoulders um, that can be spread better. Um, and and then you're talking about the singers, or are you talking about the whole operation well, within the a choir? The responsibility is regarding the the human being factor, not so much on the shoulders of the singers. They just do their job, basically, and they do it hopefully well. And all the responsibility is on the shoulders of these people and on the shoulders of artistic directors um, to build the future. And I think to build the future, it would be good to 
take the whole body and not just the two parts. Um, so this is what I think about leadership. I think we should all be leaders. And I think we are, the singers are, they all come from a place of I want to become a singer. They all had big dreams when they started to study and um, most of them, at least in Germany, want to become soloists and then they go to the choirs and they become part of a whole and somehow they lose this part of, yeah, of strength that they had to create something, also to be part of it and to think further than just to the next concert. And by the sounds of things, in, in many cases, the singers themselves are not taught to expect any other role than, than singing. Is, is, is this a, could singers, um, professional singers, uh, receive some kind of training which would help them fulfill this slightly more uh, round, rounded role than just, just, just singing the notes? Do I understand that correctly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that could also be part in the choir itself. I think that would also be an important part to grow as a choir together and but also individuals because we are talking about professional singers or professional choir singers but it's a very heterogeneous group of people. Um, and it's also different for different choirs. So it's different if it's a chamber choir or if it's an opera choir or if it's a radio choir of 60 or 70 people. Um, and they, some will need inside the choir different things, some would need a different, I don't know, field of growth as the whole group. Mm. Did I answer the question? More than. I, but like, <laughs> like, like a great answer, there are lots of other questions now. Tito? A lot of offices you now uh, work not so much anymore with function profiles, but with you look at the talent that is available with, within the office. So you actually mold the functions around the talents that you have available in the, in the office. And, and uh, that's also a little bit uh, what I hear here is that it's, it's, it's the potential that you have within a group of... Uh, of the potential body, beyond the voice. Body of singers uh, and, body of, uh, and an entire staff um, uh, that is not being used uh, fully. Then you get very quickly also to the question of ownership. And, and what we've done now is we, we've created, for example, weekends. We have one straight up summer holidays where we're actually uh, tackling this, these big topics. We have a three hour session with our core members about what is this ownership? Does it mean that the singers start to decide which artistic course we're going? Or do I still have a, a say into that? Um, but uh, and if so, what is then that role, and and how uh, how can you be more part uh, of of the group? Because it's the only way to a, a performance that is breathtaking is if everybody feels that ownership. It's, it's their show. Yeah. yeah, it's it. This sounds to me like a like a, a, a form of singer engagement. Now, how how does this work in in Berlin? And in Dublin, or for that matter, in Amsterdam. I mean, talk to us about that. Well, how, how, how far have you got to the potential, the unreleased potential uh, for singers? Yeah, um, from my side, part of the reality is that we have very different organizations. Um, and uh, to be honest, um, our choir, our singers are very privileged. Um, we have a very stable um, uh, financial situation. Um, and um, they have all uh, singers have a labor contract and are full employed, and so um, this is a very different situation. For instance, in comparison to uh, Netherlands Camco or or, or, um, or Magellan Squire, um, and especially the difference between all the freelance professional choirs. So you, I think it's a bit difficult to compare the situations. And um, of course, I can ask my singers to take um, responsibility for for whatever. But um, their main um, job is to sing as perfect as possible. And um, so I don't think that there is uh, 
um, there is a bigger interest to to um, give input in in, in, in more uh, administrational questions. But Bernard, do you do you yourself see missed opportunities because of that? Um, not really. Not in in my choir. Not not in my choir. Okay. Angela. Um, I think I sit somewhere between what Tudor has said and what Bernard has said. And um, while the scale is different, um, my singers also have a certain amount of privilege in that we're, we're the only sort of regularly paid uh, or regularly funded professional choir on the island um, where the singers have a guaranteed amount of work per year. It's not a full-time contract, but there is a guarantee of, of a substantial amount of work in the year. Um, and oddly for my... The lecture I'm giving on Friday here about managing professional singers. I talked to the singers and I thought they know better than me. What do they need as a manager? What, what, what do they expect from me? And actually, they they like to be consulted, and we do when we're when we're um, sort of reviewing our strategy, which we do every five years. Um, we talk to them. We talk about what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, what they'd like to be involved more in, what they'd like to be involved less in. Um, but ultimately, what they've said to me is that they. They just want to know that they can show up and do their job in a good environment and show up and sing so, and that everyone does their job. So they, they see it as my job to be to, to manage properly the, the, the staff team that we have, that they all fulfil their jobs. Um, and that, yes, they like to know what's going on. Yes, they like to have a certain amount of input, but ultimately they, they don't believe um, and we don't believe as an organisation, certainly, with our board of directors as well, it's, that, it, that it's a democracy in that respect. A, you know. a, not a structured, but a kind of organic dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. What's the role of Paul Hillier in that? Uh, um, probably a little more removed in some ways, but he um, he's someone who cares deeply about the singers, actually, and deeply about their working conditions. Um, and he probably doesn't communicate it to them very often, but actually it's something that... You know, he, he is their champion to me, uh, certainly, to, um, to try and build more work, to try and get more work, to try and get more good work, um, that they have viable careers. Uh, and I think that as an island nation, actually, that's, a, you know, that's something that's, that weighs heavily on me, actually, is that we have a responsibility. Write that one down. <laughs> that was a, a rather risky strategy. <clears throat> Can I add one more thing? Of course. The, um, it, uh, uh, Peggy Olislager, she's one of our, uh, um, well, she's basically invented the, the profession of dance dramaturg, but she um, worked with our singers uh, in one of those sessions and she asked a question which I find is, is hyper relevant and can really be the starting point of a discussion, is what is it, um, well, first she started by uh, breaking up the word responsibility, the ability to be responsive. And as you said, what is it you want to be co-responsible for? Uh, and I think that's a very nice starting point when it comes to uh, taking um, uh, 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 taking the topic ownership um, into an organization. Kenny. Yeah. Can I can I shortly react to that? I try to be short. No, I don't, um, don't need to be short. Make I a point. I totally agree. Choir cannot be a democracy or an anarchy or something. It would be chaos, and I would hate it. I think it needs to be led very, very well. Um, what I mean, maybe more, is to give room for all the qualities and resources that are there to see them, to acknowledge them, to appreciate them, not necessarily to put all of them into reality. And for that, in my opinion, we need to know each other better. We need to know the person behind the voice. Um, we need to know the person behind the conducting. We need to um, have a little bit more knowledge um, on how we work, how we function the best. And in my experience, this is not addressed very often. Um, this is something that everybody is responsible themselves, and that's we are all grown-ups, that should also be like that, but it is, we miss on something because of that, because we don't know each other well enough, and um, I'm talking here as a singer that jumps in in a, in a concert on the evening without a rehearsal and doesn't know a name of a single musician on the stage because this is not what you do, 
A football team would never do that. They would never have an extra football player and not know his name. <laughs> um, and also as a singer in, in the core of a group, um, that I was during Corona surprised because we had some online workshops where everybody should bring something that they do otherwise besides singing. And it was so surprising. And the next project where we sang together, we sang together differently because we knew each other. We knew that this guy, he can, he can write poetry and he taught us how to, and it's different. It's a different you, you, could, you could all do well to take a look at what the Crossing Choir in Philadelphia does, because this, mm -hmm. this actually typifies what you're, what you're talking about now. It's a, it's a, it's a, I don't know that much about it, but I have worked with the Crossing quite a lot. Quite a lot. There's a kind of integrated practice, which goes far, far deeper than um, handing, out, uh, handing out notes um, and being aware of what the real person is standing two singers away from you. Just see if you can answer this question shortly. It might be too difficult, but you get a call from one of these professional choirs. They've heard all about your views, and they want you to come in as a consultant to get this kind of thing going, to, get, to make some movement, get some change moving amongst, amongst the singers. I mean, what, what, what would be your first step? What's the first thing you do to tackle that? Mm. I think most of my work is on communication, so to find out how well do they know their choir, um, because I mostly work with the leaders or with the team that's leading the choir. Um, and we, we heard the word time factor. Um, this is, I think, the, the biggest struggle, or one of the biggest struggles, that we always have to work efficiently. And it's difficult to take time for stuff like that for a weekend, as you said, no. or, or regularly, maybe on a regular basis. Um, so basically we work on um, delegating, sharing responsibilities so that we can overall make more time to get into conversations. So it's a social process yes. also. rather than a, a kind of musical process. Yes, yeah. which I mean, for me, the most important is that the musical result is outstanding, eventually. And I think that if a choir functions as a really, really, really healthy organism and consists of incredible singers that sing as perfect as possible, then we will get the outstanding. Just a, just, just a quick jump to the side, sorry to you, one second. Is the situation in this respect different with amateur choirs? Maya, with amateur choirs, they don't spend every day with singing. There are very good amateur choirs and not so good amateur choirs and everything in between. Um, but they, they do it once a week or twice a week or maybe four times a week, but they don't live from it. So they don't go into this risk to exist from singing. No, the social cohesion exists, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. because they are not um, existentially dependent on it, they are. Much more free. Okay. <laughs> Tito, you want to make a No, point? yeah, I just wanted to add up to, to your story is that I, I, I remember starting nine years ago and I was I had just been appointed and I was standing backstage at, a, at the, I think, the first live concert that I heard of the Netherlands Chamber Choir in my function. And I heard them, they were singing Cantique et Cantique of Daniel Lesure and, and they were, they had lost their jobs. Uh, because they were had all fixed contracts because of, of subsidy cuts, they had lost their jobs um, at, 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 due to some mismanagement. Two people had to leave the choir, which went in a very um, conflicting way. Conflict way. And uh, I heard them drop in one concert one and a half tone, and I was just like, and I was standing backstage, and I was like. Oh, how can this happen? Where, where, where is this the, the famous in the Netherlands Choir that I that I know? And the, so the first thing we 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 I worked on was just uh, bringing the joy back, supporting them. professional singers live from it. But they need the joy just as hard in order not to drop one and a half tones. Or to sound interesting. Uh, yeah. Warm. <laughs> 
I want to focus, I want to change now to the where. Um, when, when I was kind of preparing for this debate, I suddenly remembered this wonderful thing that uh, Pierre Boulez said, or is said to have said. Um, he said, um, the symphony orchestra is dead. Yes. Long live the community of professional musicians. Now, let's just translate that, okay? The professional choir is dead. Long live the community of professional choral singers. What Boulez was driving at, I think, was a huge untapped uh, potential of what musicians do. Actually, what an orchestra is, but what the musicians are capable of doing. And implied in that, for me, was where they were doing it. You know, whether there would be all kinds of wonderful hybrid ways of professional singers working <coughs> in ways which 10 years ago, really 10 years ago with any of your choirs would be unthinkable. Tell us about this hybrid way of programming or working with choirs in, un, in unusual ways, which give huge new opportunities in relation to where, if there is one. <laughs> but uh, what do you mean by hybrid ways of... Well, when I look at your programming, um, and to a certain extent at your programming, uh, I mean, it's just like incomparable to what the choir was doing 10 years ago. I mean, this will sound disrespectful, but it's not. Uh, the Netherlands Schema Choir, like many choirs, would send a beautiful program for the whole season. 80% would have been incredibly tasteful a cappella programs themed with guest conductors or from a particular period. There would have been the Passion, there would have been a Christmas program, and there may have been something classical, symphonic, Haydn, Mozart. I look now at what you guys are doing. I mean, I'm surprised you say, what do you mean hybrid? Because it seems to me that you're doing it. I um, mean, you're, you're actually using, yeah, you're setting the choir in, in ways but which were semi scenic, uh, mixed discipline, um, location projects. I'm, I'm interested to know more about where, literally, choirs, professional choirs could be deploying themselves uh, in, in, in the new world? Well, I, th I, th I think what is very important is to create context. If you're talking and if you're having a narrative for your program and you're, you're touching upon a big subject, like for example transgender, and you have a trans woman composing a, uh, an opera for the choir, uh, uh, which is semi-autobiographical, you need to create um, what we did was we, we had a, a deeping stuff, it's like sort of study day, deep study day um, where, where we had the trans there so three trans men, and they um, uh, were open to say, ask us any question you want about uh, us being trans men, about transgender, etc. Let's open up the topic, you, because you need to master it. We had a huge struggle in the in the process leading towards the creation of the, of the of the piece because of the fact that there were certain elements within not so much within the organization but that we had appointed uh, were um, not able to open themselves up to, to to that discussion. And first of all, you need then to internally have that discussion. Then you get to. Uh, uh, the, Bringing that on stage in a in a in a way that is is carried and lived through by the singers, and that's also what I partially mean with being having what what is it you want to be co-responsible for. You can only be co-responsible if you if you really dig into the subject. But so, so there's there's so. Coming to it is there is we ask we are asking something different from our singers. We need to um, address their uh, uh, lackerschap, their uh, creativity. The, yeah, but yeah, creatorship, Hip. creatorship, yeah. and and uh, so we're not we're also re rewriting our audition procedure because we're not going to look only anymore at the, 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 the singing is the conditio sine qua non that needs to be taught. But apart from that, we need more. Yeah. We 
need then their physical ability, their movement ability, their uh, creatorship ability, their other qualities of being a poet. Um, um, <laughs> all of those kind of things, they become part of, of, of what the choir will be. But is, it, is this in the name of, um, I mean, literally the Star Trek uh, uh, concept to boldly go. I mean, to take the chamber choir to places where you do not expect to meet or hear a chamber choir, this where business. I'm talking physically. Gordon's going to say something about this. Yeah, yeah. Is, this is this a conscious is this a conscious drive for the, the chamber choir to go to places where uh, which would be completely new to be hearing choral music? Well, uh, the, our, our aim is for example for 2023-24 is to Bring a sort of um, a ritual uh, around the fact that we take iron from the earth and we don't we have to curse upon iron and we don't know um, as, as long as we don't know the quality and the, the, the of the of the iron and and uh, then the iron is going to put a spell on us. So it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of an ecological project and we want to actually we want to perform it. In Aymuda at Tata Steel, uh, yep. the cl as close okay. as we can Very get good. to Tata Steel. Yep. So these kind of things, yeah. Okay, right. So that's what I'm driving at, Gordon. And I'm yeah. interested in what Magella and Bernard have to say about this. Yeah. Uh, in, in our case, then all our extra activities are closely connected to um, generating income. So, um, so when we started out, we didn't have an example in the Netherlands how to um, manage a choir. Um, so if you want to play in the churches in, in the Netherlands, then maybe three times a year you will play, and every time you play in the same places. So, so um, we, we ran it as a band. So um, by doing that, by having that attitude, and I started with saying that uh, we see our choir as a group of people who sing together. Once we were invited by uh, the people of Holy Day on Ice, and everybody knows the Holy Day on Ice, and everybody knows they have music, but I, I never realized that somebody was recording that music. So they, they invited us to the studio, and then um, uh, we did a show for them. It was we sing three songs in the show platinum, uh, and um, I never I never came to see it. But the interesting thing was that that opened the door of opportunity because I thought there could be other holiday on ISIS who need the same thing. Um, right after that, we, um, we were approached by a, um, a, a marketing company who made the television commercials and they also need a certain sounds, certain voices. And the interesting thing is that it has now developed that we're not only singing that type of material, but we're actually appearing in those commercials. And, but it has a name, it calls, it called casting. We didn't call it casting because we had a group of people. And, they thought, no, this person, this person, this person, this person. So, like I said, all, everything that we do is out of necessity, but also out of our own choice, connected to, to income. So, if I have a group of 28 people who sing together, and obviously um, they, uh, their looks are now suited to what is wanted in, in the advertising field, then we can also have a casting company. And if there are companies, they call themselves, they're making... Um, uh, music designs for, for for advertisement, then we can do the same thing because that's what we do when we perform. So the whole concept of of people singing together, and like I said, we connected to 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 to, to uh, uh, having uh, to create income for a choir, but it has given us a lot of possibilities. So our possibilities go beyond performing on stage. There are certain periods that we're not actually performing on stage but we are actually at work. So that's also important because you have to, um, the singers need to sing to be, they want, if they want to be part of the group, if you want them to be part of the group, then you have to give them a, a perspective. So we are now on, on, on lots of different fields. We are, um, uh, we are being so gospel choir. So it's a, it's a mixed economy. It, it, it is, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I'm going to use that term in, uh, in uh, yeah. the yeah. It is definitely has become a, yeah. a, a, a mixed economy. But I have seen that there are um, numerous uh, possibilities. Uh, the difficulty is there, how do you preserve your own identity within that framework? But uh, that's the way that we have been doing it, and that's why we have been busy on, on a lot of uh, okay. 
uh, different ways. I, I want to give Bernard and Michelle a chance to uh, respond yeah, to this yeah. question of the, the, the where mm -hmm. and the locations, but let me just throw something in uh, before I do that because we are running out of time a bit. And it's about the amateur sector. And it would be wrong of us to finish this debate without looking at the relationship between the professional, the profession, and the huge, huge teeming amateur sector. If we think about this where, uh, where we're working, we also mean with whom we're working. And are we missing opportunities with uh, non-professional yes, singers? Yes, definitely. Uh, let, let's hear, so, Bernard, maybe you've got something okay. to say about that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. The question is, are we, are, we missing, are we missing opportunities as a profession, choral artists as a profession, engaging with the teeming world of amateur choral singing? Do you do that? Bernard, does, does Rias do that at all? <laughs> I'm not trying to catch people out, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, hmm. Not one time to think about it, maybe Magella can say yeah, something. Yeah, maybe. yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting one for me, and I, you know, uh, I, I think a lot about these terms, and I, I probably prefer the terms professional and non-professional, um, because you, you can have a reasonably good professional choir versus a, an excellent um, non-professional choir. You know, there, so, so there are all sorts of things in there as to what that actually means. Um, one of the interesting things that we find is that much of the amateur choral sector, the non-professional choral sector, aren't interested in the professional world. They, they do their choral singing in their amateur choirs and they have a great time. And a lot of those choirs want to leave, they want people to come and do workshops perhaps. Um, but in terms of an audience for, for professional choral music, that the core audience for professional choral music is, does not come from the, the amateur sector in Ireland. Um, maybe that's a problem we have, and maybe we need to explore that. But that, that I think that's a fact, and I've talked to other colleagues in the UK and throughout the rest of Europe, and that does seem to be a, a thread that runs. Um, so, where we see with dealing with non professionals is more about the education side of things, the learning and participation side of things, but not to tick a box of saying that would be great to go out and work with, a professional, with an amateur choir, but actually that, that has some meaning for the group that does it. Um, and for us, the next generation of professionals, and that's not just singers, it's the next generation of composers. That's the difference, isn't there, between well-designed side-by-side projects, yeah. uh, professionals and non-professionals, and getting them to come and hear yeah. the concerts. Yeah. And I also think as well, um, and that this is kind of part of the where answer for me, is uh, we can sit from on high if that's where we think we are as a professional group and say we're going to go out and do workshops, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Is that what's wanted? Is that what the audience wants? It, we have to figure out where the audience is and we need to bring ourselves to the audience. Bernard. Yeah, whatever we, we uh, offer to, to non-professional singers, it's not um, to, de to develop new audiences for us because we made the same experience like Magella. Um, our audience are not the um, ambitious um, uh, amateur singers. Um, uh, therefore, we, we try to come in connection with them. We, we organize workshops. Um, uh, we just had a, an, an event where Justin, our chief conductor, Justin Doyle, offered to our subscribers a, a, a workshop um, uh, rehearsing a piece which is um, on the program right after this workshop on the same day. Um, but um, yeah, we we try to to keep our minds really open to to uh, to create programs in every different direction, um, as long as we are able to to perform um, it really convincing. Um, but uh, and for for this reason, we we sometimes choose um, uh, locations which are not regularly used for for uh, uh, concerts, um, and then we will reach people who are going to this uh, concert because the event is cool, um, uh, but they don't will uh, be a regular audience uh, in the future yeah. for us. Um, so it's, it's a difficult question. And, um, and I think we dropped that illusion a long time ago, didn't we? If you go and work in yeah. the old gasworks, 
and you use 10 kids as uh, percussionists. It's an illusion to think that they'll be booking for Mozart uh, next month. But I don't think that matters, we, personally. Yeah, we have, we have one program in, um, where we, we have a, a partnership with the school choir of, um, um, from all the pupils um, for one year. And we made an experience uh, that they come to the concerts, really, because they, they build a relationship to the singers. Um, we, we visit them in their rehearsal, they come to us. Um, we have uh, workshops to have a view behind the, 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 the stage. Um, and so a personal relationship um, grows up and they will come to our concerts. And right, so it's working. Yeah, yeah, but but very very yeah. small steps. Gordon, he wanted to. Yes, I, I, I know yeah. you could write a book on this, but okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so my thing with uh, is this with the term professional, because in my opinion, my personal opinion, the, the the word professional is connected with perception, and that is in the Netherlands is classical music. That's the way they perceive uh, professional choirs. So they are uh, classical. The only uh, from the classic professional choir, uh, professional uh, classic choirs are the only ones who are being who are getting any funding. So the percept and, and also there's uh, then you have the, 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 the definition of, of, of professional and there's also another one of quality because uh, here in the Netherlands we have professional classical music here and then at one time you have nothing and then you have the rest and that type of perception has to has, has to change if you want to. Um, give new input to the word professional and who are enabled to become professional and who have the, um, uh, what the, the potential what's the, the, the potency and to, then, to, yeah. to be, become professional the interesting thing with our choir is that um, I know, I'm not an example for everybody and also I'm drawing from my own experience is that for instance that um, at auditions that we have I think 99% of all people who come from the conservative they, they cannot make it through the um, uh, to, to the auditions with us because we see that they are too fixed on sheets. Mm. They are not in sync with the rest of the group we, and we need that in, in our genre, we need that in our sound. Uh, we, our recruitment comes from people who never been part of the formal music sector so they haven't been singing in choirs, they haven't been singing going to the music schools, they haven't been going to the conservative. But the interesting thing is they are interested in that music, otherwise they wouldn't be in our choir. And I think we have to address that matter first. So the definition of what is professional and the definition of what is perceived as being okay. a quality. And okay. if we address those things, then I think that a lot of new opportunities will Thank come. you. Thank you. This is a really important issue. It has nothing to do with music. It has everything to do with a kind of respect for the status of everyone who inspires. So yeah. you've thrown open a very important book here. Well, we're, we won't get very far with it now because no, we're already no, over no. time. But thank you for raising that. Um, they put us in the graveyard slot for this session, as I said. But one of the great things about the graveyard slot is that nothing happens after it. <laughs> so I am going to go a few minutes over time just to, in case there is a question. I wanted to give more time for questions. but. There's so much experience and expertise behind the table. Does anyone have a question that, uh, that they're burning to put to the, to the panel? If not, we have to conclude that we have answered all the issues arising from where is the future of professional choirs. <laughs> oh, we have a very boring panel. <laughs> <laughs> is, is anyone out there? No. Can I address one thing that I think is not being, it has been addressed? I, I love the different approaches on that. And uh, going back to the question, where is the future of professional choir? Um, uh, the future is also in the young generations. And I think uh, I would strongly advocate, and I will do that, with, I do that with every politician that I have in front of me at the moment, is to uh, bring uh, singing back into the, in the elementary school, but also in the secondary uh, school. I have uh, uh, four kids from 12 in the range from 12 to 17. They are all uh, um, having difficulties to express themselves because that's the age where you have difficulties expressing your emotions and, exp uh, and talking about topics. 
uh, you don't stop your afraid uh, with your peers, etc., etc. Singing is such an amazing way to do that. In order to be able to do that, we need to invest into choral conductors in this uh, country, uh, and we need to pay them well. So um, first you. we need to work on an infrastructure, but then also we get uh, 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 a more diverse um, uh, group of people into the conservatories where we need them, or um, um, uh, in, a, in another road where Gordon uh, uh, needs them. Um, but that's yeah. highly important. Thank think. you. Uh, thank you yeah. for raising that. Can I, yeah. can I just follow on that actually? Because um, we're about to launch our equality, diversity, and inclusion policy, which we've written with the Irish Chamber Orchestra. We've decided to approach it together. We have different action plans on how we deliver it, but, but the basic policy is there. And the thing that both organisations struggle with is the fact that we can't have a diverse choir in Ireland until the education issue is, is sorted out from, from age three, um, because kids just don't have the wide access that they should have to mu quality music education, whether it's choral singing or, or instrumental playing or whatever that might be. I'm, I'm a champion for singing, but um, that, that's the big problem in our society. As well. Fantastic. Can I, can I work Jenny, go ahead. Sorry. I want to, to pick up where Bernard left with the personal relationship. I think this is also where the future lies. And it, I mean the personal relationship from the choir to the audience, but also inside. I don't think that only by going to the choirs we can um, build up the personal relationship, but also by them, by helping them, by helping people that might be interested and can be amateur choirs, amateur non-professional singers, um, by being visible who we are, not just a group of people dressed in black going on stage and nobody knows who is who, but... This is the where question again, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. It's more, I mean, the where is for me in this, in education and in building relationships, but not just by really going there and saying hi and shaking hands and making music, okay. but by being an inspiration, yeah. inspiration where where the people can resonate with. When they go to the concert, they don't just hear perfect music making and crazy, amazing sounds, but they see it comes also from how the people work together. This is this is what I want to do. And, and people like us. Yeah. 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 Community. Yeah. Yeah. We must stop now, otherwise um, I'm going to get into real trouble. <laughs> um, I hope that. Oh, I'm sorry. Did someone? I, right, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Please, yeah. They love choir singing, that, but they don't practice it by themselves. Um, and they are, yeah, they are like classical music. And um, two thirds of, of the audience is always the same in each program, um, independently from the repertoire we are performing. But one third um, depends on the repertoire. So if we have um, a, a premiere from a new piece, um, we have some people there who are uh, uh, in the uh, contemporary music scene. Uh, um, so I'm not able to, to define very precisely who, who they are. But, uh, yeah, it's a similar quick, thing, quick, and there are people who, who yeah. love choral singing, um, and th there is a, a really interesting fact um, in Ireland, um, not one of our national sports, Gaelic football, and there are children's Gaelic football clubs everywhere in Ireland, um, intermediate clubs and all the rest. Um, there are Ga Gaelic more, football. Gaelic football. There are more people singing in Ireland than playing Gaelic football. Um, <laughs> and we don't see them at our concerts, you know, so we kind of, that, and that, that is a fact that's known. Um, so the number of people who are actually actively singing um, in community, it's, 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 what, the wide range of community singing. Okay, so you guys um, so were in the room 
when the Chamber Choir Ireland project Gaelic football was born. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll pick that up. Okay. Last word to Tino. One question to the amateur world is, 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 is yes, there, we have 1.7 million singers uh, singing in the choir in the Netherlands. Yesterday, uh, it should have been packed with people. Every session here should be packed with people. Why is that not the case? Okay. And this is organized by an amateur organization, Simic. I love them to death. They're amazing at what they do. Why is that not the case? Well, as someone once very famously said, uh, the director of the South Bank Centre in London, when she was appointed, and was said that the one thing that the South Bank Centre had to do in the next 10 years, it was to engage the community. And she said in her interview, that's very well and fine, but I think you will find that when you call the community, they have made other arrangements. <laughs> and so this is... I mean, you could devote an entire conference to this. Um, I hope that if there's people here from Leading Voices that we do pick up in a future project, a future seminar, the question of uh, school singing, because we all know what that's about. And some of these issues as well engaging with, with amateurs, because I think there's just a world to win there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming and being so attentive in such a hot room. Uh, say thanks, please, to our panelists. Thank you.